Do you sometimes feel that your actions bring unexpected consequences? Do you sometimes feel stuck between counteracting goals? If you recognize this, chances are you're experiencing dilemmas. But don't worry, you're not alone. After extensive stakeholder consultation, it's obvious to us that urban dilemmas are a European-wide phenomena. Dilemmas are in fact part of daily life in an interconnected and hyper-complex environment. In decision-making, dilemmas may appear as a choice between equally desirable or undesirable options. What seem to be straightforward action plans can in practice lead to unexpected outcomes. You know that cities are more than the sum of its parts and action plans, they don't always work as expected. Urban planners face the challenge of setting strategies towards moving targets. While some targets support each other, others conflict across administrative departments sectors and societal groups. In order for us to succeed, we need to prepare urban transition pathways for conflicting targets and wicked issues. Because dilemmas will always be around. So what we can do is to acknowledge them, befriend them, don't fear them, instead ride with them. It is time to join forces in the dilemma-driven approach to urban innovation. Do you want to learn more? Why not join our urban lunch talks and sign up for the policy conference where we explore urban dilemmas and their consequences on urban transitioning. So, hello everyone and welcome to this urban lunch talk organized by the UPI Urban Europe. As you know, this is the second webinar in a series discussing urban dilemmas. And today we will talk about digital transitions in urban governance. Um, UPI Urban Europe, that's a European hub for research and innovation to address urban challenges. It's a platform to create, combine, and discuss and make available knowledge and robust evidence for sustainable urban solutions. My name is Sissi Askvall. I'm the Secretary General of VA Public and Science, and that's a Swedish nonprofit association aimed at promoting dialogue and openness between the public and scientists. And I will facilitate this webinar together with co-moderator Caroline Brangstel. Who are you, Caroline? Hello, Sissi. Once again, it's funny because we're in the same room. And hello, everyone participating. Uh, I'm Caroline. I'm an urban geographer, and uh, I'm part of the team who worked on these webinars. Uh, I just wanted to say a few words about how you participate here because we really encourage you to take part. And there are several ways to do that. You can do it through the chat. Some of you have already started. And if you're in the chat, please select all panelists and attendees or everyone when you type your messages so that everyone can see them. Uh, later in the, in the schedule, you can also choose to raise your hand and then be featured on video if you want to ask a question or share a reflection. And, and there will be three chances to vote in our polling stations. Uh, as well as write questions in the Q and A's whenever you want to during the during the webinar. And if you're experiencing any technical issues, just type in the chat, and I will try to help you. Yes. See you later. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Caroline. So the purpose of this webinar is to make 
product results around Europe available and useful for cities and their stakeholders, and also to help making sense of the urban dilemmas that are facing European cities. And this is the second, as I said before, the second in a series of four webinars to take place now in December and January. And for the schedule of today, we will meet with invited panelists who will share different perspectives on how digital transitions affect urban governance. And they will also provide us with some examples which can serve as a starting point for our joint discussion. And you will, everyone, every one of you will be able to take part in the discussion. So let's get started. First of all, we are curious who has joined the webinar today. Could you please tell who you are by participating in a poll, which you can see in the screen now. So who are you? Can you uh, check the relevant box with the main reason why you're participating? You're participating in the role of a city official, business representative, NGO representative, politician, citizen in general. Of course, everyone are also citizens but this is the main role in which you are participating. So citizen, researcher maybe, student or, or other. And if you tick other, you could also define in the chat, who are you, what, what role, what capacity are you participating? And then you just, uh, you just press also the submit button and we soon see the results coming up. Let's take a look here. So uh, researchers of about one fourth of all participants today and a lot of others, more than 30%. So please uh, use the, the chat function to, to tell who you are. And we also have quite a few NGO representatives, about 20% and fewer city officials and business representatives. No politicians, not yet at least. And let's take a look in the chat too. Who, who you are. From an NGO, I'm from the Slovenian Research Agency you see the chat function down below in the middle, so you can press and take a look for yourself. Other, as in managing a transnational initiative between member states. Well, that's an interesting one. And also uh, someone from a research funding organization. Great. Thank you. So, um, we will soon meet with our invited panelists. I would just like to make a short recap on this dilemma approach that you are using. An urban dilemma is defined as two or more competing goals, stakeholder interests or related strategies that bear the risk of failing to achieve the aims because implementing one strategy might hamper or prevent the achievement of the other one. And today's dilemma is about how urban governance can benefit from the digital transition societies undergoing right now and avoid overinvesting in technology that might backfire. As you know, we all know digitalization comes with a lot of potential for more efficient and inclusive dialogues. Public authorities can use digital tools to facilitate citizens' access to information and offer better services. And social media and digital applications of it, different kinds can make it easier for citizens to form local stakeholder groups and actively engage in dialogue with local authorities and being involved in shaping their urban environments. But of course, there is a risk that, that public authorities implement expensive and suboptimal technical solutions that not necessarily benefit all societal groups or even might exclude certain ones. And there are also integrity and data security issues to consider. So how can cities work with capacity building and inclusion of organized citizens and neighborhoods when using digital solutions? That's what we like to discuss with our panelists today. 
So I would like to say welcome to our first pan panelist, who is Bella Kesi, uh, a thematic expert at Herb Act, which is a European program aiming to foster sustainable and integrated urban development in cities. Uh, you're an economist by training, and founding and managing director of Megacom Development Consultancy in Hungary, uh, which is focusing on regional and urban development and also supporting European programs and projects. And you told me about several good examples how digital transition affects urban governments in a positive way. Which one would you like to tell us a little bit more about and why do you pick that example? Bella. Hi everyone uh, from Hungary. Uh, before I start with the example, just three short things uh, to uh, describe my Ars Poetica when it comes to urban development. The first one is successful cities steal ideas from each other. So I think it is important that cities hear from each other and share knowledge between each other. The second one and I think it's really related to digital, the city is like an open source software. Nobody owns it, everybody can use it, and anybody can improve it. So that's really an important thing. And the third thing, it really comes down to digital. Uh, we are living in a digital age, so we like it or not, we have to adapt. Adapt or we are just left behind as a city. Now, uh, these are the three things I wanted to start with. And uh, after this short introduction, uh, you asked Sissi about mm -hmm. uh, examples, and there are many very interesting examples, and I had a dilemma which one to share with you. Uh, but finally, I, uh, I focused on one that is still in the development phase, but I think it really represents well. Uh, what it is all about. And it's the example of the 13th district in Budapest, Hungary. It's a district of the capital city uh, with about 120,000 inhabitants. And uh, it's a location of many IT companies. There's a really vivid IT uh, scene in the area. And uh, they have an opposition leadership as well, which is an interesting mm -hmm. setup. Uh, but uh, what they want, they realize that, uh, and that's also thanks to the digital companies and the digital ecosystem they have uh, in the district, that it's important to do something and, uh, about digitalization. And the local government really wanted to coordinate and help this process. So what they did, they initiated to develop a digital wallet, uh, which is like a city card, but it's much more than that because it's based on smartphone applications and it gives much more flexibility and much more opportunity. And when they started to uh, exploit what they can do, they very quickly arrived at the uh, idea of e-democracy, how to use digital solutions, IT solutions to involve and engage residents in urban decisions, urban development decisions in the area. So that's what they are doing and they are planning at the moment. They want to come up with a strong demand. And as part of this process, they very quickly realized that uh, digital divide is in existence. So if they want to use e-democracy solutions, and if they don't focus on people who might not be uh, digitally prepared or groups which are socially disadvantaged, uh, then they may leave them behind. So from the very beginning of developing this e-democracy solution, they started to focus on how to involve these groups and they have various ideas to do that, like intergenerational training courses mm -hmm. whereby young people train elderly people uh, using the digital solutions or having info points, physical points where people can come in and, and uh, learn about it and get help in using e-democracy solutions. But if I don't even have a, a, a smartphone, for instance, or a computer, how, how can then they participate anyway? 
uh, they can. I mean, these e-democracy points, physical points, actually provide an opportunity to walk in the so there are physical uh, points that can that can me? be used. Yeah, you, uh, I'm sorry, you have you some me? some problems with, but you said that there are some physical points where people can interact using digital tools of yes, various kinds. Yes, and and uh, they are also planning to have special equipment, special devices with for people, like for example, uh, visually impaired people. Uh, to enable them to participate in this e-democracy process. Okay, thank you. I think you, we come come back and discuss that example a little, little bit more. But I would like to invite our second uh, panelists too. Let's turn to Marina Nego. Uh, you're a co-founder and partner at Make Better, which is a consultancy in Romania. Uh, you're a development professional with work experience from many countries, especially in Eastern Europe, and your academic background is within urban economy, local economic development, and spatial planning. Do you have any reflections on the example that Bella just mentioned? Oh, we can't, maybe you can unmute your microphone in the, the, um, the left corner of the screen. If you unmute your microphone there, when we can hear you, hopefully. So in below in your screen to your left, there's, um, you can choose between muting your microphone or opening it up just by pressing the icon with the microphone. Mm -hmm. Is it working now? Oh, now it's working. Thank you. Okay. So I was just asking you, Marina, yes. do you have any spontaneous reflections of the example that we just heard about from Hungary? It is unmuted. Yes, it works. We can hear you all. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, digit planning processes, like uh, urban planning documents and local development strategies and uh, of course, we tried every time to test different uh, participatory tools and uh, tools that would help transition those communities to, to digital uh, tools. However, we understood that uh, it depends a lot on the aspect or the topic you want to uh, implement that particular tool. For instance, um, if you're trying to build a, a tool to help in a participatory planning processes, uh, it may have a uh, limited efficiency because in a participatory process, you really want to facilitate the inclusion in this process of all groups of society, the elderly, the less educated, the poor, and so on. However, mm -hmm. if you're testing different products or services uh, where it's not necessarily important or essential that everyone engages in that particular tool, then uh, it's much better or, it, or it's much, uh, say, easier to test digital tools. Uh, we've had uh, our own experience in this and a lot of lessons learned. I'm not sure if it's the moment now to share um, the project. Mm -hmm. See, I'm not hearing you now. Yes, so um, it's, it's a good time to share your, your example of, um, you had an okay. interesting uh, example from your hometown of Bucharest. <laughs> we've, uh, we've worked a lot in urban regeneration and we're uh, particularly interested in the topic of housing. Uh, we decided to um, uh, um, attend a bit on the problem of vulnerable uh, housing in Bucharest, especially housing vulnerable to seismic risk. Uh, Bucharest is a kind of building, so we've created a data crowdsourcing platform in which we georeferenced all the buildings that were reviewed by the municipality as being risky. Uh, we um, uh, illustrated them on an interactive map. 
and then our um, a uh, goal was to mobilize citizens to um, introduce data about those respective buildings. So was to um, um, understand how many people live in those buildings, because the only data available was on where the buildings were and, and what's the year of construction. There was no understanding of the uh, human side of this potential risk. So uh, we've implemented this three years ago and we realized while working on this platform that indeed if you want to uh, research a topic that is spread over a particular territory and that might engage with very different groups of the society, such a participatory digital tool may not be the best option. Uh, what we did is that eventually we uh, mobilized volunteers Mm -hmm. And uh, the volunteers went door to door and also gathered information from those respective buildings, from people who weren't accessing the platform by themselves. So uh, these volunteers went with their smartphones and filled in the survey on site. And this is how we managed to reach two thirds of the listed building uh, buildings. And we counted so far uh, more than 8,000 people in red dot buildings. So these are buildings which we know for sure that they will collapse at the high intensity earthquake. It's been very insightful for us in how to test such a digital tool on a topic of, of a lot of interest for the local community, actually. So you're talking about red dot buildings, and that's actually because you, you put a physical red dot on them. I think we, you can see uh, a picture now from one of those buildings and the red dot, I guess it's it's right front. Mm -hmm. is, is that correct? Yes, yes, yes. So um, the municipality at some point uh, sent uh, engineers, structural engineers to buildings that seemed vulnerable in Bucharest and they reviewed a few, a few thousands buildings and from this it resulted that several hundred buildings are vulnerable and most probably they will collapse at the next time there's the earthquake. So we have a list which is actually, you know, a, a, a non, uh, it's a non-editable uh, PDF from the City Hall website. Uh, it's, it's not data that can be used. We uh, cracked it in a hackathon with several software uh, engineers and we georeferenced it uh, and uh, we have this um, in, uh, interactive platform now available on our website, seismicalert.ro, in which if you click on each dot, you find details about the buildings. And uh, the dark red buildings are those that most probably will collapse at the next high intensity earthquake. It's a major problem in Bucharest. Mm -hmm. However, we uh, realized, uh, uh, we learned a lot about the demography of, of those who live in such buildings. And as I was telling, we discussed a lot, uh, we've discovered elderly people and poor families or families that uh, either cannot afford technology or have no experience in using it on a regular basis. So um, um, our uh, experience in this is that such participatory uh, crowdsourcing platform, uh, their efficiency depends a lot on the topic uh, you work on. And I have another example to illustrate uh, uh, also a technical topic, if I can introduce that. Yes, maybe we can just first ask uh, Bella, do you have sure. any reflections on, on this very example of this particip participatory process to, to detect those vulnerable buildings in Bucharest? And I think it's time for you to unmute your microphone in the, the lower, uh, to the lower yeah. left on your screen. Thank you. I did it. I did it. Can you hear me now? Yes, please go ahead. Okay. Uh, so I think this example very well illustrates that uh, although we are talking about digital solutions, we are still talking about people. Uh, we are talking about people needs. Uh, how can we make the life of people better? Uh, so there is no use of digital for the sake of digital. Sometimes I've seen cities doing actually that, using digital because it's fancy, because it's fashionable, but actually the digital didn't help making the life of people better. And I think the Bucharest example uh, really illustrates well that uh, it's actually there's a problem, there's a city problem, and they apply digital solutions to address that problem in an efficient way. So I mm -hmm. think that's one key message for me at least. 
Yeah. So if I just ask you a quick question to the two of you, uh, can inclusion of all citizens be ensured when you're using digital solutions in city planning? Yes or no? Uh, I would say no. No. And um, Bella? Uh, I would say yes, but. Okay, so, so please continue. Yes, but why? Yes, uh, but on the one hand, it's not necessary all the time involving all people. So that's, that's one important thing. There are different groups uh, you need to involve regarding different issues. Uh, and the other one, yes, but it requires major efforts from, uh, from the local partnership and from the local government if they want to involve all people, all residents. And I'm not saying every single one person, but I'm saying the representatives of most groups, even the most vulnerable groups. But it's difficult okay. and it requires major efforts. Okay, and Marina, you just said no. Why did you answer so? Why not? Well, of course, I'm biased. Um, my work consists a lot in uh, grassroots work. So I, I work in a, the poorest and most marginalized neighborhoods in the cities we interact with. And uh, what we are facing is an increasing digital divide. And there's this uh, echo effect in which um, a younger, gener younger generation, younger people, those who use on a regular uh, basis uh, social media and tools, uh, take this for granted and uh, have the feeling that if something goes viral on Facebook or on different social and uh, websites that indeed have a lot of traffic, then such problems are well known and they have reach, which is really not the case. And it's really, really easy to create this illusion that something is known and it's popular. Um, um, and uh, I mean, you can always uh, eliminate this bubble if you do field work and if you also use different kind of research tools and engagements in a complementary to the digital tools that you, you may be testing. As you just did in, in Bucharest, what you told us about. Yes, it, of course, it also depends. Uh, so there may be cases in which uh, the larger community indeed benefits of digital tools, though they not, they're not necessarily asked to uh, engage or uh, use those tools. And uh, maybe this is um, the, the point to um, also um, tell a, bit, a few words on the example of Early, which is a Poland organization. Uh, they specialize in um, creating and installing sensors that monitor air quality in cities across Europe. And they have uh, quite a good coverage in Polish city already. And uh, recently they've installed some sensors in Bucharest and, and the data they've collected is really alarming. Uh, so this is a very good argument and uh, very good information for um, environmental groups and advocacy groups in Bucharest to ask from the city hall to invest more in uh, aspects such a, as clean public transport and uh, measures that would limit uh, traffic pollution in Bucharest. However, so the, um, uh, the entire community may benefit of uh, the introduction and use of these digital tools, but you don't necessarily need the entire population or representative group to test or to use these tools. You just need a, a bunch of civically engaged engineers to install, install a few such sensors in a city. And then uh, some environmental groups um, and, and uh, advocacy groups, uh, which are of course formed of a limited number of uh, civically engaged and educated people to take on those data and uh, create uh, awareness campaigns and advocacy campaigns. Yeah. So you may have the community in its entirety as beneficiary, though you, you don't necessarily need them to, you know, to be part of it literally, like to, to use those sensors or to install those sensors. But they can benefit from it. And that's an interesting example too, that you can use those tools to empower citizens by using the, the most active ones or the, the digitally savvy ones to, to help everyone to to, to empower and to, to, um, to make the cities, city better. I would like to open up and ask all of you participating in this webinar, and let's make an, another poll. And I would like to ask how often 
you all take part in decision-making processes in your cities by using digital tools. So let's see, we can get another poll up. So the question is, approximately how often do you participate in decision-making processes in your city by using digital tools? So it could be like web pages or apps. Uh, so the options uh, are every day, on a weekly basis, monthly basis, yearly, or more seldom every other year, or less than every other year, or never. And there's also the, the option of uh, uh, ticking the other box, and then you can, can specify in the chat what you mean by that. So I welcome you all to tick the appropriate box. How often do you participate in decision-making processes in your city? And after you ticked your box, please also press the submit button below. And we soon have a result. And please, panelists, you can also do this. Hmm. No one did it every day, but on a yearly basis, about one third, and a little bit more than one third said you never did that. Every other year, 5%, less than every other year, 16%. So it's not used very often. We can, we can conclude that, right? Um, do you have any comments on this, panelists? Or yeah, I would like to invite you all to give your comments by using either the, the chat function, or you can also raise your hand and you'll be able to to take part and also be shown uh, using the microphone and video to take part in the discussion, if you like. So. Any comments? Uh, if you want to speak, please unmute your microphone. I do have a comment on this. Yes, um, please, Marina. Um, so uh, having citizens participate in a decision-making process, it implies that the municipality that takes care of, of their town is using such tools and chooses to use such tools for participation purposes. And I think this, um, this really depends on the degree of maturity of the urban uh, municipalities in different countries with regards to public participation. For instance, in Romania, and I dare to say in Eastern Europe, because I've also worked in other countries in the region, our main uh, struggle when working with the city hall on participatory planning processes is to convince the city hall to do participation processes at all like to do meetings, to display their plans, to communicate with the people, to ask their opinion and, and to allow their engagement in that participatory planning processes. We are at the stage in which uh, we as uh, NGO people or as consultants, we are educating local authorities to, uh, to understand the usefulness of such tools and adopt them in any way possible. And I must say that the the first way or the easiest way is to start communicating and to, to bring people around the table. So face-to-face -face interactions like meetings, focus groups, consultation events. This is, like say, the first layer. Um, uh, for me, looking at the uh, examples of, of many municipalities I've worked in Romania, I think this uh, using digital tools for participation or decision-making is a bit more sophisticated than the uh, level we've reached so far. And I would say that this is something that will follow, for sure will follow. Maybe um, uh, I would expect this to follow from uh, more developed towns 
who have a uh, more competent and more, uh, you know, like a, they're more early adapters or have uh, managed to retain more talented staff and more open-minded and, and skilled and, and maybe trained uh, abroad. But uh, I still think that it would be a lot of time to convince municipalities in these parts of the world to increase their transparency all together and to do at least some participation, be it digital or off offline. Yeah. yeah. I just wanted to tell you, maybe you're, you're waiting to listen to another panelist, but unfortunately our third one, he, he had to cancel because he had uh, sick babies at home that he need to attend to. So, the, so we are all participants are very welcome to join the conversation and I can see that there's some discussion going on in the in the chat, but you are also very welcome to raise your hand and also use the, the mic and, and the video if you like and, and participate in the discussion. Bella, do you uh, want to, to I, add I to I just it? want to add that, yes. Yes, uh, I actually completely uh, endorse what Marina said so far uh, in terms of digital tools are there, so tools are not lacking. Uh, even sometimes the competencies and capacities of people is there. But in Central Eastern Europe, definitely, and towns of Central Eastern Europe, people are not accustomed to being active part of, of urban development decisions. Uh, so people are not used to having a real say. Uh, and in most cases, local authorities and the leadership of local authorities don't really care. So I think it takes time and I agree also that we should start a step before and we should uh, have meetings and focus groups and real forums rather than one-sided communication from city leaders whereby they go somewhere, invite people and then they explain what the city will do for them. It's, uh, the first step is to be open and to have an approach what the city can do with you uh, as people and residents of the city. So I think it's, uh, it's a long process. Uh, we need to work with the local government leaders, convince them that it's a valid tool. It's actually good for the city. It's actually good for them as politicians. It actually increases their popularity because in the end they want to be reelected in a couple of years time. And if they understand that involving people helps them to be more popular, more accepted, and, uh, and it can even help to make better decisions because uh, an open discussion with people can actually bring in ideas local authorities don't even think of, uh, then the process can start. And I also agree that retaining young, talented people, involving them, uh, bringing them back to our cities can help in that process. Okay, so the key issue is not how best to engage citizens, it's more about convincing the politicians to involving people in the first place more substantially. But generally speaking then, if we, we open up and, and look at Europe as a whole, how are European cities doing if we talk about innovative governance? Uh, not only Bucharest or, or Budapest, where, where you're living. And I, again, I invite everyone to, to, to give comments and, and have their views on this topic. I can, I can. Please. Can I so I, I'm trained in London in urban planning, and I must say, for me, uh, to um, um, to be a part of uh, consultation processes and, and data gathering tools, and to uh, assist to how the Greater London Authority was involving citizens in different planning processes was for me a cultural shock, and uh, this is just uh, symptomatic of the profound divide in terms of practice and mentalities and um, urban planning expectations uh, from Western countries as compared to uh, Eastern European countries, especially those uh, 
coming from the post-socialist sphere, uh, which are societies most used to having top-down decisions imposed on them. And this spirit of being part of the decision and asking to be part of the decision is not yet mature. I, I would say that we're still young in our democracies and that there is a, a, some, a few generations uh, that need to be changed in order to progress indeed in this respect. Uh, but what I was seeing, so you're asking how, how if we're exposed to how this happens in other countries. Um, in large cities like uh, London, global cities, uh, have the benefit of um, having within those cities some uh, demographic groups which are really the early adapters of technology and so they have the um, benefit of being able to test and innovate while having benefiting from the uh, the talent of the IT and technology residing in their cities and at the same time having the budgets and the uh, sort of uh, maturity and, and perform on public sector services in terms of tendering, in terms of uh, planning processes, in terms of uh, decision making that can allow to, to have this ecosystem uh, which allows for adaptive capacity, so it, which allows for uh, indeed public sector authorities to be able to keep up the pace with the technological advancement. If I am then coming back to my country, it takes so much time to for the uh, civil servant body to understand what's out there in terms of technological advancement and to uh, adapt to the skills required in order to um, uh, to um, understand the opportunities they have at their disposal and to uh, include digitization in the uh, modernization processes. But there's a, a significant uh, skills mismatch here. So I think that the uh, towns from Western Europe or more developed countries, especially global cities, have, have a, a body of personnel like civil servants already uh, you know, familiar with, uh, with technologies and technological updates, whilst in less developed or developing countries, uh, you have a, a body of civil servants that are uh, need a lot of uh, sort of capacity building in order to keep up the pace with what's happening in this digitalization digitization um, revolution, if you say. Okay, so Bella, would you uh, agree or do you have another opinion on this? A couple of things. I think critical mass and, uh, and the availability of talents and knowledge uh, is important and having an ecosystem and global cities are clearly has this advantage already at their side. Uh, the, the other one, uh, lack of knowledge and slow moving public sector, that's also, that, that's really a problem in, especially in, in Central Eastern European cities. Uh, but we still have, I mean, in terms of smaller towns, I still believe that uh, they, they have the advantage of being closer to the people and the local government is closer to the people like in a big metropolis uh, you have a couple of millions of people so you can't really be close to them in a smaller city i'm coming from a town of 120,000 inhabitants uh, there's a strong community already existing and there are there is discussion and dialogue take, uh, taking place uh, so i think that's an advantage uh, these smaller towns can build on and the, the, the last comment I wanted to make is that uh, it was mentioned a couple of times that we have a, a history of a top-down uh, system whereby decisions are made at the top and people on the bottom actually uh, suffer it. Uh, basically, I can still see in our countries that there's still uh, after the change change of regime, uh, there's kind of nostalgia towards the towards the times whereby uh, the government and the public sector did everything for the people, so you didn't have to take care of things. And this kind of nostalgia is still used by politicians. So even if some people, some politicians, uh, would be maybe open to a more open uh, way of uh, involving people, mm -hmm. they actually can realize that the successful way is to do many things for people 
instead of asking them and involving them because it brings them short-term success, re-election. So that's also a difficulty we have to uh, overcome. So let's open up and I would like to ask every one of you that are participating what competence and capacity is needed for civil servants and politicians to drive the innovation that, that really is needed for your, your hometown or your city. So you see there's another poll coming up, uh, the question being what competence and capacity is needed for civil servants and politicians uh, not only to be reactive, but is that drive innovation that is needed for your city. So um, if you tick one of those boxes, and um, also please develop your answer in the, the chat. So the alternatives being training in innovation thinking, uh, more economical resources, civil servants need political support, public support for innovation measures, changes in the regulatory frameworks, changes in decision-making processes, and more collaboration with other stakeholders, so improved social networks, and also leadership qualities, which you have been talking about already, panelists. Uh, this is a quite difficult one. What competence and capacity is needed? Can we take more than one box? Yes, we can. That's good because it's difficult to choose for just one alternative. So please take a few seconds to to give your answers and then press the submit button. Okay, I made my decision. Oh, interesting. Uh, so the most common alternatives being chosen are more collaboration with other stakeholders. So more collaborations and um, closely followed by training and innovation thinking. And we also have quite a few that uh, have chosen changes in decision-making processes. And also civil servants need political support. And leadership qualities was also ticked. Uh, interesting. So um, please uh, give your comments by raising your hands or using this chat function. Um, do you have any spontaneous reflections, um, Bella? Was it unexpected uh, yeah, or? Uh, no, no, it wasn't unexpected at all. Uh, I think this is something. Uh, well, it, it most of most of the statements with the highest vote actually uh, are the same. What I I said also in the poll. Uh, maybe leadership quality. I think mm -hmm. uh, for me it's a crucial issue. Uh, we need real leaders in cities. Uh, and, and what I've seen in Hungary, at least, that that's one problem is that uh, mayors are elected representatives, elected people, which is, of course, good. But at the same time, in uh, quite often I see that uh, most mayors don't have any previous experience in urban development, in the operation of cities, urban areas. Uh, participative techniques and things like that. They don't have an understanding how a city works. So I would say, in addition to leadership, uh, leadership qualities, uh, knowledge of how a city works and how a city should be managed and led, and the skills and experience in that area would be crucial. So that's, yeah. that's what I see here. So who should uh, educate them then? <laughs> Can I, can I add something? Yes, please. So, 
there are very different incentives for public institutions as compared to private institutions. A, a company has a profit maximizing behavior. It has the highest incentive to adopt any technology or tool that may cut costs and maximize revenues and profits and so on. Whilst a um, public sector institution lacks such incentives and uh, people take decisions based on what the law obliges them to do, so what's mandatory by law, and um, they have a budget maximizing behavior. So city halls are happy if they have large budgets, not necessarily they have a um, good impacts in terms of what they do with the respective money. So I think it, we really need to change this mentality and uh, increase this culture of a performant public management in which services are thought having the beneficiary in mind and there's the maximum um, um, openness towards um, actively searching and adopting tools that may improve the uh, efficiency of public services and i'm referring obviously to technology tools the uh, mm -hmm. civil servant will have the same wage uh, if they implement a, a digital tool or if they don't do that so they have the same wage and they have the same uh, long-term unlimited contract if they do a consultation process or not so uh, th there's a huge change in mentality in being more oriented towards the, the citizen and the impact uh, of, of what they do. And this can be done partially by training. Mm. Mm. Bella, do you, do you agree? Uh, yes, I do agree. Actually, uh, uh, my experience is you have to be able to tell, well, definitely to mayor, city leaders, but also civil servants, what's in it for me? I mean, mm -hmm. for him or her. Uh, mm -hmm. So if you can convince and if you can show that it's actually good for them, it helps their work, increases their uh, acceptance among the parties, uh, among the residents, then, uh, then they can be open to the process. And uh, what I see that you should start an experiment, start in small and experiment and invite civil servants, invite city leaders to events where they can actually experience how does it work and it could really be beneficial uh, and they can hear good ideas and they have they can have a good dialogue uh, city leaders in my experience fear of dialogue because uh, in many cases and that also requires good facilitation in many cases what they see people complain complain about their small individual problem rather than having a constructive discussion so I think good facilitation, understanding of uh, of people needs, uh, having a having a way to 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 make people understand that they can talk about their small individual issues, but also they should be part of the dialogue of more citywide or group interests as well. But another aspect is, of course, with social media, which can be used uh, by societal groups of different kinds to, to gather and to mobilize and, and to actually uh, get to politicians, local officials, and ask for changes, improvements of different kinds. Maybe they, they, the, the officials, the, the politicians, must then react and uh, take action because uh, do, you f do you see from, from your home countries such examples that people are actually using the digital tools to get together and to, to take action together? Well, I think that social media can be easily um, uh, drawn into political fights. So, of course, it is really, really useful for uh, watchdog activities I, and like shaming if uh, the city hall does an investment that does not have the right impact or does acts of corruption and so on. Um, however, it's 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 the social media can also allow for other political parties to uh, invent or sort of to. Um, 
um, distort different facts of reality in order to um, uh, promote different messages of their own interests. So I think the problem with social media is that it's really easy to manipulate. And we've seen this uh, in uh, larger countries and, and more important powers in the world, what the um, um, mixtures in social media can do for political elections, for instance. Yes, that's, that's of course the, the bad part of it. But I, I was more asking if you, if you can see uh, good sides of, of the, the well, technology. Well, it does help a lot because um, especially for some groups, like it's, it's really easy for a city hall to communicate its accomplishments and its projects and its plans. So it's a very easy and direct way uh, and can be really interactive um, and can really help in, in communication because otherwise what can a city hall do? They can print uh, magazines or do posters on the streets, but uh, social media, it's much more uh, generous in terms of content that can be sent and uh, easiness of interaction with these risks, risks, of course. And we do have quite a number of uh, city halls that um, uh, managed to do very good social media campaigns uh, and their benefit was that it increased the trust in the uh, local community and the prospects of the city because sometimes uh, what's the easiest uh, message to propagate is the negative aspect or the problem the, the the thing that has not been done was that has been done wrongly and sometimes the positive aspects have a, a, a lower reach so they, they reach uh, more difficult so social media can help in this respect that uh, it can uh, sort of um, uh, be a tool that would uh, would uh, help facilitate uh, messages of richer content Ambala, do you want to add something on this yeah, yeah. Uh, in my experience, social media can be a really useful political marketing tool. Uh, the examples I've seen, cities were quite good in presenting the results, their achievements. On the other hand, uh, if you look at the comment section uh, mm -hmm. of uh, uh, on social media, you can see different kinds of reactions. One is, of course, of course the negative reaction. So people are never satisfied. Uh, and you can always find uh, people who don't agree with something, even if it's a good thing. But on the other hand, I think it's the question of how open uh, the city leadership to look at those comments, even, even the negative ones, filter out uh, the, the political negative messages, and then try to understand uh, the feelings, uh, the perceptions of people, that could be really useful. What I don't really see is that it's really happening in many places. So they push their messages, but I don't really care about trying to understand the perception of the people as reflected in the comments. Okay, thank you. So let's try to, to summarize, let's, let's try to conclude what has been said. So I would like to ask you, you panelists about your takeaways from this discussion. Uh, what would you like to say to urban practitioners who battle this dilemma in their everyday work? Um, so just one minute each. Um, I also invite you all to use the chat to tell each other what reflections or ideas have come to your mind or what you will do next. And you can also share links or contact information with each other if you like. So uh, let's start with you, Marina. Well, how would you like to summarize this discussion? I would say that uh, digital tools and technologies have a great merit that they uh, give the uh, chance for communities to do uh, different data gathering or to uh, give arguments for civic uh, groups and advocacy groups uh, that um, help push for different policies. However, uh, there is a big difference in adaptive capacity of the public sector as compared to the private sector. So I would estimate that the private sector, be it for profit or non-profit, is more of an early adapter to digital tools than the public sector, and that there will be an increasing divide between the private sector on one hand and the public sector on the other hand, and at the territorial level, 
I think there will be an increasing digital divide between uh, Western, more developed countries and municipalities as compared to um, Eastern Europe or uh, less um, um, rich uh, towns or uh, smaller towns, yes. Thank you. And Bella, your conclusion? Uh, my, my conclusion is, uh, is that basically digital tools are very important but they are just that, tools. Another tool in the toolkit of uh, local authorities to address urban issues, urban challenges. Uh, so it's not always the answer to use digital. There are many examples, like the ones we heard from Marina, that you have to combine uh, digital and analog uh, solutions to address certain problems. So that's, that's one important conclusion that don't use it for the sake of using digital. Use it because it's the, probably it's the best solution to that situation. The other one is you need understanding and commitment of the leadership. So city leaders need to understand and need to accept digital tools. Otherwise, it won't really work. Third conclusion, special groups need special attention. Otherwise, they would be left behind and the digital divide will increase. So we have to be careful with that. And of course, uh, digital is a fairly new area. So you have to experiment. It's not, I mean, being innovative and being brave uh, is not really a characteristic of uh, the public sector. But still, if a city wants to be successful, they need to be a bit more open, start small, dare to experiment and progress gradually. Okay, thank you. That would be the, the last word. I would like to thank you very much and thank you to all participants for your active contributions. And the results from the discussion today will be distributed to all participants and materials that we have talked about will also be made available on the web and the recording, of course, from this webinar as, last as, as well as the last one last week, the Urban Lunch Talk on Urban Spaces. And the chat room will stay open for another 50 minutes if you'd like to share info with each other or ask questions. Um, you're very welcome to join the next Urban Lunch Talk that will take place on the 11th of January. Then the topic will be from urban resilience to robustness. And just like today, the webinar will start at 1 p.m. and end at 2 p.m. So thank you all very much. Merry Christmas and hope to meet with you all in January. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.